Because you have to start soon. Please kind find kindly find your seat, please. We will start the session to please have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, so you have got your 15 minutes break. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming back. And you eventually had your 15 minutes break due to help of technical issues uh, courtesy of Zoom. Um, this session is now starting quarter past. Um, and uh, uh, we have this session is scheduled to last um, uh, 45 minutes, uh, of which uh, Honorable Justice Michael Kirby will uh, be presenting for 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Eric uh, Haskett, who sits next to me and who is human rights uh, officer at UN Human Rights Office in Seoul, will be presenting for 10 minutes. And uh, our colleague and guest from Germany, Nikolai Spreckels, is also going to present for 10 minutes. I think it is uh, called for to give a short bridge between these two sessions. And the short bridge exists uh, of explaining why this uh, report about exploring legal avenues uh, has significance to uh, the presentation of Justice uh, Kirby. Uh, first of all, this Gen uh, GNF report is a small stepping stone in the direction of seeking uh, the accountability. And why is it a small stepping stone? Well, first of all, it is by no means a comprehensive analysis of what is known out there as evidence, recorded evidence of abuses of human rights in North Korea. The mandate given to us by NK Watch consisted of just three important points. The first point is to um, investigate the nature of the harms as reported by individuals who suffered by North Korean regime. And this uh, material consisted of 800 petitions that NK lodged um, with the UN. So it is a very small amount of facts. Secondly, the most important thing that researchers were supposed to research was to qualify the crimes that were described or events or facts described in these uh, testimonies and see to which sort of family of international crimes they could be uh, assigned to. And the third point was obviously to um, list the possible justice mechanisms to deal with them. So turning to um, connection with a report of Commission of Inquiry in a North Korean uh, situation and report published in 2014 as, as follows. I think this um, report, 2014 report was some kind of watershed. It was a loudspeaker, a megaphone, to the world. Since that publishing of this report, there is no way anyone in this global world can say, oh, we did not really know what was happening in North Korea. After this report, the big issue is now that we know what we can do, what is the state of civilization at this point? What are the mechanisms that we can offer? And I'm not talking just about nation states and politicians and political power. We are also talking about combined efforts by private NGOs, as many of you run one, NGOs as associations of citizens with certain goals to pursue. We are talking 
This, in combination with treaty organization, and certainly as UN, which is still a lighthouse for all of us to follow when the human rights abuses are concerned. So what could we do in our joint efforts? And Justice Kirby's intervention, uh, as of uh, this year's February, in a letter written on behalf of all three commission inquiry members to the Human Rights Council was very telling because he put in writing that all three members of commission would encourage legal practitioners, prosecutorial bodies, civil society organizations with expertise and UN member states to work with the OHCHR and with the victims and their representatives including escapees from North Korea to examine any novel legal approaches that can be enlisted to achieve accountability. And this is why we hope that Justice Kirby is going to address us what has really happened and what are the avenues that he discovered and he is trying to uh, address seven years after this very important commission that inquiry was published. Justice Kirby, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trump, and uh, I pay my respects uh, to the colleagues from the United Nations family uh, and the vital work that they do, particularly the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, who provided uh, support and assistance but respected the independence of the Commission of Inquiry. This is the report of the Commission of Inquiry. This is the report that was delivered to the Human Rights Council uh, in 2014. And this is the report that must be acted upon and sim not simply put in the bottom drawer of uh, the big offices in Geneva or New York where it will be forgotten. I also pay respects to North Korea um, Human Rights Watch uh, for its um, consistent and committed actions which come together in this webinar which we are conducting today. And I pay respects uh, to Sir Geoffrey Nice and to the Geoffrey Nice Foundation for the uh, excellent work that it has been performing uh, and supporting and that is the subject of the reports that we have received already at this webinar today. Uh, this is exactly the type of follow-up action that the Commission of Inquiry uh, and uh, its members considered should be taken. Uh, the action uh, of the uh, members of the Commission in writing to the uh, Human Rights Council was not usual, but it was taken uh, on the permission of the Special Rapporteur on uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Thomas Arroyo uh, Quintana, uh, and uh, it was laid before the Human Rights Council. It's important for me to point out that I am not now, uh, in respect of North Korea, an officer of the United Nations but no one could have gone through the process of preparing this report and unveiling the shocking evidence that was powerfully presented in the public hearings of the Commission of Inquiry, adopting a methodology of transparency to respond to the secrecy of North Korea was our means and those means resulted in this report and this report must be acted on by the international community. Uh, last week 
in the United Nations at the General Assembly of World Leaders, uh, statements were made by many of the world leaders which are relevant to uh, this webinar today. President Biden, fresh from the reports of the shocking events in Afghanistan on the departure of United States and other countries' military forces, made the point that problems of this kind cannot be solved by any individual country, however strong, however powerful. Problems of international human rights uh, need to be solved by the United Nations and by the cooperation of all countries. And that is the message that is respected in this report and that must be brought to this webinar today. And secondly, President Moon Jae-in of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, made the point that action has to be taken to deal with the issues of security and peace in the Korean region. It is natural and it is responsible that President Moon Jae-in should be very deeply concerned about the dangers to peace that exist uh, in the nuclear stockpile that has recently been built up by North Korea. Uh, and his call, which reflects a statement that existed in the report of the Commission of Inquiry, for action to negotiate a peace treaty to finally end the Korean War of 1951-53. That statement is a good and helpful uh, intervention and it should be followed up. But one lesson can be taken by us all from this report. There will be no peace on the Korean Peninsula. There will be no peace for the people of South Korea. There will be no peace for the beloved people of North Korea unless there is action on human rights in North Korea for the reasons that are explained in this report. And that is why dealing with human rights is urgent, uh, is a priority, uh, and is important for peace and security. Peace and freedom from the risks of nuclear weapons are themselves human rights concerns, as President Moon Jae-in recognizes. But you cannot just deal separately with security. You have to deal with it connected with uh, and associated with action in respect of human rights. And that is why this webinar today is so important. Uh, it reminds the international community of uh, the situation of human rights in North Korea. Nothing that has come to the attention of the United Nations, of the Office uh, of the United Nations in Seoul, uh, or of the international community, or the High Commission of Human Rights, uh, or the Human Rights Council, indicates that the problems in this report have been solved. They have not been solved. And the world promised in 1945 on the Charter of the United Nations and repeated in 1948 on the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that it would not look the other way. It would not turn away when confronted with tangible and, and reasonable testimony of uh, uh, crimes against humanity, it would not look away. And that is why this webinar is so important. I congratulate all of the lawyers who have been working for the Jeffrey Nice Foundation, going through the possibilities of following up the report, 
these possibilities, all except one, were mentioned and explored in the report of the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, the one that was not mentioned was the one that has been opened up more recently by the Gambia in the proceedings involving Myanmar, Burma, uh, and that opens the possibility of action in the International Court of Justice. That, as has been pointed out, is a possibility. It has some defects and some weaknesses. But in this situation, we must explore every possibility, uh, including those that the Commission of Inquiry itself uh, identified, and including those that have been explored and outlined today. It is not my function to say what will work or what will not work, but the one lesson that comes from this report and from the reports we have had at this webinar is doing nothing is not an option. Doing nothing is not an option in respect of the crimes against humanity that were revealed in the report of the Commission of Inquiry of the United Nations. North Korea did not have to join the United Nations, but it did join the United Nations and it signed the international treaties on human rights and it is bound by those treaties and it must be made accountable for those treaties and that is why this webinar uh, conducted uh, in Seoul and brought to the whole world as the report of the Commission of Inquiry was is so important and so timely. So I congratulate uh, all those who have worked with the Jeffrey Nice Foundation and with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, with the Special Rapporteur, with the Council on Human Rights, with the General Assembly, and uniquely with the Security Council that received the report of the Commission of Inquiry on its agenda, where it still remains. And I encourage the closest examination of the possibilities that have been outlined today and action. Words are good and words are powerful, but action is what is vital. And that is why this is a timely, important and overdue webinar and I hope action will follow. Thank you very much, Justice Kirby. Uh, I already got several questions um, addressed to you, but uh, I'm not sure whether you will be able to stay with us for the- No, I can stay, I can stay. I'm Thank not you so to... much, because uh, I would not like to uh, break the sequence of speeches because once we start discussing it, there will be no end to it. So thank you very much and stay with us. And our ne next speaker, is um, Erika Haskas uh, from UN Human Rights Office in Seoul, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Haskas. I'm a human rights officer and international lawyer on the accountability team uh, within the Seoul office of the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, I've been here in Seoul since March 2020, but due to corona, this is the first time I'm seeing many of you so uh, I would like to take the opportunity to express my thanks to you for being here today, whether in, uh, in person or online, and to express my deep respect for all the work that you do on human rights in North Korea. Uh, I will be providing a summary of the most recent report of the High Commissioner to the Human Rights Council on accountability in the DPRK, which was delivered in March of this year. As you are aware, the sole office of OHCHR and the smaller accountability team within it were established by the UN Human Rights Council at the recommendation of the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the DPRK and the group of independent experts on accountability. OHCHR opened its sole office in 2015. In March 2017, the Human Rights Council mandated OHCHR to strengthen its monitoring and documentation efforts to establish a central information and evidence repository 
and to have experts in legal accountability assess all information and testimonies with a view to developing possible strategies to be used in any future accountability process. In March 29 and March 21 sessions, after reviewing OHCHR's reports on the work carried out so far, the Human Rights Council adopted resolutions to continue OHCHR's accountability work for an additional two years. This extension constitutes a very positive signal. It confirms the international community's commitment to accountability for possible crimes against humanity committed in the DPRK. In the most recent report, OHCHR describes the activities carried out to implement Council Resolutions 3424 of April 2017 and 4020 of April 2019. The report summarizes the accountability work of OHCHR in four main areas, strengthening monitoring and documentation efforts, consolidation of the Central Information and Evidence Repository, to which all of your organizations are strongly encouraged to consider contributing, the development of strategies to further accountability in the DPRK, and engagement with the DPRK and the international community. OHCHR continues to interview victims and witnesses of human rights violations to collect information on acts that may give rise to individual, criminal, or state responsibility, and to conduct research on command structures of state entities which may be responsible for such acts. Since the opening of the Seoul office in 2015, more than 400 interviews have been conducted, mostly in person, with escapees from the DPRK who had recently arrived in the Republic of Korea and other victims and witnesses in the ROK and Japan. Accordingly, the report also examines information gathered by OHCHR in light of relevant international legal standards, which suggests there are reasonable grounds to believe that crimes against humanity are still being committed in the DPRK. In the interest of time, rather than summarizing the entire report, I will focus on OHCHR's key legal findings. So as you all know, the Commission of Inquiry in 2013 noted crimes against humanity taking place in the political prison system of Kualiso, as well as in the ordinary system of detention facilities, labor camps, and Kyohaso prisons. OHCHR continues to examine information <coughs> relating to all possible crimes against humanity identified by the Commission of Inquiry but has initially prioritized analysis of crimes for which we have recently received the most first-hand information, namely imprisonment, torture, and enslavement within the ordinary prison system. That said, OHCHR continues to document and analyze information dating back to the Korean War. Escapees continue to provide information primarily on human rights violations in the ordinary prison system run by the MSS and MPS. Most of these interviewees are from and were detained in the northern provinces, most likely due to international travel restrictions, excuse me, internal travel restrictions. Most of them are also women. We refer you to our recent report on human rights violations against women in detention for more details on the disparate treatment of women in detention and its disparate impact. Recent first-hand accounts on political prisons, or Kualiso, remain scarce, likely because political prisoners are rarely released and more closely monitored if they are. Nevertheless, OHCHR continues to collect and analyze secondary and open source information on political prison camps whenever possible. The report notes that for acts to rise to the level of crimes against humanity, they must take place in the context of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. This attack does not have to be in the context of an armed conflict. OHCHR's analysis has not revealed any significant shift from the findings in 2013 of the Commission of Inquiry as to the existence of a systematic and widespread attack by the state against people deemed to be a threat to the political system and leadership of the DPRK. The report summarizes OHCHR's analysis of possible individual criminal responsibility for officials of the DPRK under different modes of liability, including direct participation, command responsibility, or joint criminal enterprise. In its next phase of work, OHCHR is seeking additional information to link criminal acts to decision-making processes and state policies. With respect to the crime against humanity of imprisonment, 
The information gathered by OHCHR provides a reasonable basis to believe that state officials of the DPRK continue to imprison individuals or otherwise severely deprive them of their physical liberty in violation of fundamental rules of international law, such as criminalizing the exercise of basic human rights and failing to provide the most basic assurances of a fair trial. These acts may amount to the crime against humanity of imprisonment if found by a court of law to take place in the context of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population, as previously indicated by the Commission of Inquiry. With respect to the crime against humanity of torture, OHCHR received credible information about beatings, stress positions, psychological abuse, forced labor, denial of medical care and sanitation and hygiene products, and starvation in places of detention in the DPRK. These combine to create an atmosphere of severe mental and physical suffering in detention, exacerbated by extremely poor living conditions inside detention facilities. Multiple credible accounts of such abuses provide a reasonable basis to believe that officials of the DPRK have and continue to intentionally inflict severe physical and or mental pain upon detainees in their custody. And such pain or suffering did not arise only from or was not inherent to or incidental to lawful sanctions. These acts may amount to the crime against humanity of torture if found by a court of law to take place in the context of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population as previously indicated by the Commission of Inquiry. The report examines some examples of information provided by a small number of OHCHR's interviewees, suggesting that since 2014, there may have been some improvement in the physical treatment of detainees in at least some detention facilities. While these examples suggest that some efforts have been made in the DPRK to reduce beatings and ill treatment in at least some locations, there is no clear indication that the state has introduced comprehensive measures to improve conditions and treatment of detainees in detention facilities and to guarantee basic fair trial rights. Many of OHCHR's interviewees described being subjected to hard labor in Rodong Danmyonde, or short-term labor camps, by an administrative process without trial. Others were subjected to forced labor in Kyohwaso after patently unfair trials, many of whom were sentenced for crimes that consist of the exercise of fundamental human rights, such as leaving one's own country or receiving information from other countries. OHCHR also received reports of individuals subjected to forced labor in pretrial detention. OHCHR recalls that not all forced labor is prohibited under international law, and forced labor may not amount to the crime against humanity of enslavement. Hard labor is not prohibited as punishment when it arises from a sentence by a competent court in a fair trial. It is the conditions of the forced labor that may cause it to rise to the level of enslavement or perhaps other inhumane acts of a similar character intentionally causing great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental or physical health. Again, if found by a court of law to take place in the context of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population as previously indicated by the Commission of Inquiry. In light of the conditions of forced labor described by interviewees, OECHR acknowledges the need to analyze additional information and evidence to determine if the crime of enslavement continues to take place in the DPRK. It therefore intends to continue to examine forced labor in its next phase of work, and in particular, recommends the additional examination of options to pursue financial and corporate accountability to address illicit trade in goods produced by the use of, excuse me, produced through the use of forced labor by detainees. OHCHR's report concludes that there remains a reasonable basis to believe that crimes against humanity have been committed and may be ongoing in the DPRK. OHCHR reiterates that there is no statute of limitations for crimes against humanity, and those responsible for past and ongoing crimes should be held accountable. So the top priority remains either the creation of an ad hoc tribunal or referral to the International Criminal Court. While preparing for criminal accountability at the international level, 
it is imperative to ensure that information continues to be collected and preserved and additional accountability strategies are taken forward, including at the domestic level. Such information will be useful in support of complementary non-judicial measures towards the realization of the rights of victims, such as developing a historical record, memorialization, reparation, and truth-telling exercises. The report calls on the DPRK to grant OHCHR access to the country and calls on member states to exercise jurisdiction, including universal jurisdiction, to investigate and prosecute international crimes. It further calls on all member states to maintain civic space, in particular with respect to victims groups and other CSOs engaged in gathering information about the human rights situation in the DPRK and advocating for the rights of victims of human rights violations. As part of OHCHR's ongoing work on promoting accountability in the DPRK, other groups' analyses are important to this office, and we continuously assess them in the context of our own ongoing work, including a paper by the Jeffrey Nice Foundation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Haskett. I'm quite sure that there are already many questions being formed in your head, including me. But we are turning now to our last speaker of today's uh, seminar or hybrid webinar. Uh, uh, Nicolas Spreg Nicolai Spreckels is going to talk uh, uh, about the role of international NGOs accountability in the DPRK. Actually, he's going to tell us how um, how, how much attention the NGO world and um, uh, actually dedicates to North Korean issue that is with us for decades now. And some people never even started to deal with it and some people got tired of it because there is no significant change in their work. So I hope you will be able to enlighten us what uh, does at least uh, Western Europe do with uh, things about these complex issues? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me. Before I start to explain uh, what Nena already introduced to you, what I will talk about, allow me quickly one remark. Um, as Sir Geoffrey Nice did in the beginning, you all have the pre-written speeches by all speakers on the panels today within this booklet. And I will alter my speech a little bit today because firstly, um, I have to speak very slow for the translator. So the Korean translation is very accurate, which is important. And secondly, uh, we have had many new information today, even to me from other speakers. So I would like to catch up with that and not repeat something that was already told. Um, I'm probably a quite unusual speaker at this kind of conferences because I'm from Europe and in Europe there's just two NGOs who exclusively work for North Korean human rights. Considering how many human rights NGOs there are in Europe, that is a shockingly low number considering the amounts of crimes against humanity committed in the DPRK as we have heard on many occasions today, and as we all know through the CRI report. Mr. Ahn invited me to explain how international NGOs, and I will focus a little bit on Europeans here, could help the purpose to have international attention and cooperation on projects like jurisdiction. So I would like to explain the development over the last years in European politics regarding North Korean human rights crimes. Before the CRI report, um, there was almost no awareness or any knowledge about details of crimes against humanity in North Korea in the European public. It has been very rare that somebody would know more than, let's say, the first paragraph of a Wikipedia article about North Korea who is not for some reasons interested in that specific geographical area. Also, politicians had not really a focus on that, and that is quite natural. If you consider a German parliamentarian, for example, is elected, and to be elected he needs public uh, support. 
to run the national affairs of Germany, social affairs, and also the German foreign policy. It is just not attractive to a European member of parliament to get into a such complicated issue as North Korean human rights and to deal with that. It is complicated to get detailed, verified information. It is complicated to select trustworthy witnesses or trustworthy NGO partners. So therefore, to achieve much more interest in European politics on North Korean human rights, the cooperations we had before with NGOs from South Korea, I think personally have been a very good attempt and we need to strengthen that. So there's many South Korean NGOs which have naturally different political points of views, different goals to go for, and they don't operate on any project they might have. That is natural. However, if you want to have international support for the human rights work or possibly jurisdiction, we should try to find together local allies. So for example, at least two North Korean defectors within this room, like Mr. Ahn and Park Geun-ok, have several times been to Germany, talked to parliamentarians, had hearings at the German MOFA, and that is a very important task for Korean NGOs to support, because you all can feel, if you read something like this here, I report, which is from my point of view a remarkable document, because not only provides it so much evidence, but it is quite easy to understand for anybody who reads that. It is still just a written text. And whenever a German parliamentarian or diplomat, for example, listens to a person who experienced that kind of human rights violations, it changed that attitude of that person quite a lot. It is much more sincere. It would stay in your mind what you just heard from a person who experienced that. So therefore, it is my strong belief international NGOs should cooperate with the South Korean NGOs. Not telling you from international experience what Korean NGOs should do, but offer their help to make Korean NGOs more successful in other countries, especially when it comes to Europe. Um, we cannot do much as the two European NGOs that we are without help of South Korean NGOs. Let me explain. There's no use that we start to investigate North Korean human rights violations from out European countries. We don't have that kind of exit that you have here. But it is much more easy for us, since we know the local politics, the local interests, maybe some local cultural uh, differences that might be leading to complications when engaging. We can help with that. And that kind of cooperations can also become quite practical. Uh, to give you a really short example, six years ago, uh, Mr. An Myung Chul, together with a friend from another NGO, came to Germany talking about the issue of North Korean slave laborers in European member states, like, for example, Poland. It is much more easy for us to research, uh, to research and to find evidence in Poland than for Korean NGO. But it is, of course, necessary that we learn about that issue from the Korean NGO. We were completely unaware of that situation. However, for a Korean NGO to fly to Poland to investigate there is much more difficult than for an NGO based in Europe. Uh, we just took by car with a tiny team maybe four hours and we were at the sites, shipyards, construction sites where North Korean workers worked. So it was a very productive cooperation after South Korean NGOs, namely Mr. Han, explained to us what's going on and how this is going on. We could develop a program and a plan how to collect evidence and how to push European governments and the European Parliament to pay attention to this kind of issue. Therefore, I would like to conclude just uh, by repeating my appeal that uh, it would be helpful for international and European NGOs if Korean NGOs would help us by cooperating within each other and with international NGOs to present the issues to the European parliaments, 
European NGOs that work on several different human rights topics as well, as to probably also European diplomatic representations, because uh, in my opinion, a project like jurisdiction cannot be done successfully without having support by international governments, by international representations for, of diplomats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Spreckels. Um, the official working part of the conference when it comes to presentation is over, and I would like to thank interpreters for excellent interpretation because I have been getting information uh, as our speakers were speaking that interpretation was very good, but also um, interpreters, thank you on behalf of all of us, but also I would like to thank speakers who all of them understood that having 10 minutes did not mean that I had to speak very fast and put as many words as they could in 10 minutes, but that to our delight, they concentrated on important messages they wanted to convey to us. And I'm very pleased that this first part of the conference worked very well when uh, interlanguage communication is concerned. Thanks, of course, to the <coughs> interpreters. Uh, having said this, I would now like to open the time for discussion, which was scheduled here uh, for 15.45, and I'm very pleased to see that we catch up on time as well. Uh, I will turn to our host and to ask uh, how much time for um, uh, discussion we shall have so that I can maybe compress some of the questions I'm getting uh, online and so that we do not waste uh, too much time and that we actually use this opportunity uh, to ask and to discuss some important issues with distinguished speakers of this panel. How much time do we have? Um, so we are going to have 15 or 15? 15. 15. 20, 20 minutes, wow. A very efficient way of uh, dealing with timekeeping. Um, so um, Ms. Nam uh, suggested that the first question go to uh, Justice Kirby because he would need to leave us the first. And while you are maybe preparing your questions, I already have questions online for Mr. Kirby. Justice Kirby, are you with us? And the yes. And so allow me to ask a very short question that I got um, online for you. And uh, the question uh, obviously is when it comes to available legal mechanisms, is there any legal mechanisms for you that you thought would be the most uh, uh, adequate at this point of time? The most adequate would be uh, the use of the International Criminal Court. It's a UN court, it is established, it has a jurisdiction, uh, it has a means of securing jurisdiction over DPRK, it requires a reference from the Security Council of the United Nations. And there have been two cases where a nation was not a party to the Rome Statute, where there has been a reference, uh, and uh, therefore it could be done. When the report of the COI was considered in the Security Council, I was invited to sit there. And in that beautiful room in New York, you see 15 human beings who have the great responsibilities of the United Nations uh, in dealing with very difficult and complicated matters. 
it cannot be said that it is impossible. It requires the concurrence of the five permanent members, and that means it includes the need for concurrence by the Russian Federation and by uh, China. Uh, both of those countries have been uh, unfavorable to action as proposed by the uh, COI, but when we look, we can see that uh, the Security Council has, in the years since 2014, twice approved increases in sanctions against North Korea, which means that China and the Russian Federation voted for those increases. And so it is not impossible, it is the best way forward, and we should not accept ourselves the moral responsibility of not using the best way forward by abandoning the effort. It is the obligation of members of the United Nations to use and reuse uh, efforts to get the Security Council to fulfill its responsibilities. This was promised in 1945 and 1948, and now is the time to require that the promise be delivered, and if it is not delivered, to identify the reason why. I think it is unlikely that the General Assembly would create a special tribunal. I think there would be difficulties in the International Court of Justice pursuing the matter, and as the report today has pointed out, doing so has some real problems, especially with enforcement. Uh, but uh, we have to keep up the dialogue and we have to inform the world and we have to place the moral responsibility for no action on those who stop action. And that includes any in North Korea and in the Republic of Korea who stand in the way of having matters considered by the one organ in the United Nations family that has the jurisdiction, the power, that it needs the door to be opened. And that is what should happen. That is the most swift, economical, appropriate, uh, and cost-efficient way of having these issues determined. North Korea denies the findings of the report of the COI, let them deny that before the International Criminal Court. Justice Kirby, um, should, uh, following Justice Kirby, thank you so much. And following on what you just said, um, there is a, a fact in uh, today's world that this is that international criminal justice is slow process. So. Uh, choosing one of the avenues and then waiting years and years to get negative or positive result or any result at all uh, must uh, uh, can be discouraging also. Are you one of the legal practitioners who would actually suggest to concurrently uh, deal with accountability at any of these three mechanisms, or every, each single of these mechanisms, to start an ICC procedure, an ICJ, and to try to find a state that would be able to implement universal jurisdiction? Or would you say, no, choose one wisely and concentrate on one of the mechanisms and wait and see what is what will happen? The answer to that question has to be decided essentially by Korean people. This is their family. This is their nation. These are their people. These are their cousins and uncles and grandmothers. They have to decide this. 
I myself think they should pursue all options. Time is running out for many of the options to be fulfilled, especially family reunions, which could be so simple using Zoom technology. It is barbarous. It is barbarous to deny links between the people of North Korea and their families in the Republic of Korea. Uh, and so I think everything should be tried, but uh, the priority, I believe, should be dialogue in the United Nations and promotion of knowledge in the international community and clever negotiation. President Trump, I think, was right to have a meeting with Kim Jong-un. Doing nothing is not acceptable, but his technique of negotiation, of going straight to the most difficult center was not a correct way of dealing with a very complex diplomatic problem. The right way is to start on the outer circle and to move from relatively easy tasks like family reunions by Zoom technology, a very easy technical task that should be possible. And then moving slowly but surely, but not too slowly, into the core of the problem, which includes human rights and nuclear weapons. And that is what should be done. And that is what ROK should be endeavoring to get done. And giving away items like a peace treaty without getting anything at all in return is not really a very sensible way to negotiate with a state like North Korea, which believes in having tantrums, like blowing up the building that was built for dialogue, blowing it up, smashing it, destroying it, closing the conversation. That is childish behavior, and it has to be called out by all members of the uh, international community. Kirby, thank you very much. Would you be willing to stay with us for one question from the audience? And yes. after that, we will release you from your duties with us. You're um, sounding very judicial. Oh, okay. I'm learning. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, it has something uh, efficient in the ways you do it at court. So why shouldn't we That's try it true. as well? Uh, please, has anyone from the audience ready to ask the question to Justice Kirby. Including in Korean and translated. Maybe someone from Zoom audience would like to ask a question. Jeffrey, do you have any questions to Justice Kirby? Only if nobody else does. But there is a, uh, one question I would like to ask him. Thank you very much for his contribution, noting how he showed the way, not only in the way he ran the inquiry with public hearings and evidence, but thereafter using every opportunity to make public its findings. He really set as a scene for the rest of us. But the question I have is in two parts, really. Uh, first, I think he's touching on the point, and it's not a comfortable point. We have to recognize that to get something to the International Court of Justice, for example, needs another country with a shared interest. And in the case of Gambia, the shared interest with uh, Myanmar was, of course, or rather was a range of Muslims, was of, course, was of course Islam, and that was why this small country was able to do what everybody 
else was fearful of doing. There is no country with a shared interest in DPRK's offending except one country, and that is the country where most of you are sitting at the moment. And that's a reality we have to face. We understand that that country cannot take its neighbor to the ICJ for all sorts of reasons. But that is, in reality, what will be, I suppose, the natural step to take. And so my question to Justice Kirby is this. If, as he very helpfully says, all avenues should be pursued, does he have advice to give NKW or anyone else, does he have any advice to give on which country we, it may be possible to stimulate to take this matter to the International Court of Justice? Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to start by paying my respects to Sir Geoffrey himself. When we were preparing our report and considering complex questions of international law, uh, we had a meeting with him in uh, London. I'm sure he doesn't mind my revealing this. Uh, and uh, over a very frugal uh, uh, repast, uh, we talked about issues, serious issues, that were coming for our decision. Uh, and I thank him for that, and I thank uh, the Foundation in his name for um, pursuing this uh, hybrid webinar. As to the nation or country that would have a natural role in taking uh, DPRK to the International Court of Justice if that were determined to be a realistic and useful uh, strategy. <clears throat> um, I, I think it isn't quite true to say no nation has a natural reason. Uh, it may not have a reason like religion shared between a victim and an accuser but every nation has the common uh, interest in the purposes of the United Nations, in the principles of human rights, in the Charter of the United Nations, and in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, who would be most appropriate in the name of Eleanor Roosevelt and René Cassin's great charter who would be the most appropriate to pursue uh, the issue of North Korean human rights? Not looking away, not turning their back. One country that stands out, I think, could be Germany, could be uh, the European Union uh, as a group of countries, could be the countries of Europe that saw the horrors of the Nazi oppressions uh, that occurred in my lifetime uh, when I was a, a boy. Um, and it may be that even the events that are happening in Germany at this time will open possibilities that might be pursued because Germany has had a resurrection since the Second World War, and it uh, might possibly take and pursue this course. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Sprinkles mentioned Europe, and our chair mentioned Europe, and Europe was a strong supporter of our investigations. So I would not put that out of the question. I do agree that it's not possible for the Republic of Korea and I can't see any other nation in the immediate region, I don't think it would be appropriate for the Western permanent members of the Security Council, but uh, there are some who have seen the horrors of crimes against humanity close up, and it may be that they would be willing to pursue this uh, strategy if it was considered to have a possibility of success. Justice 
Kirby, thank you so much. Um, we are now continuing uh, without you and we hope to stay in dialogue with you in the future as well, to draw on your experience as a justice and as a um, human rights activist, as you have become now one. Thank you very much and hope thank to you, be Dr. in Dr. touch Dr. soon. Thank you very much. Um, so we have one minute left for the question in the in the room. If um, it takes time for you to gather courage, I already have one question here uh, on online question which I can pose. And this question goes to Nathan Fuller and it is about his uh, interesting example of a protected group and his mention of Hutu and Tutsis and how it could, uh, first of all, it was an interesting um, uh, example, but that would need a more or, um, of explanation uh, how could it be, uh, what is analogy with the ongoing uh, um, issue we are discussing with in North Korea. So Nathan, if you can hear us, would you be able to expand a little bit more on this particular um, question? Um, I'm sorry, my um, my internet uh, class, so I actually uh, left the call and joined about um, 10 seconds ago, so I think I missed this, the start of the question, apologies. So the question is about the possibility of expansion of legal interpretation of genocide in North Korea regarding Sungban system and uh, in connection with um, explanation about protected group uh, uh, in Rwanda's uh, genocide case between Hutu and Tutsis, what is actually the parallel uh, that one could draw and use for North Korean cases? Of course, uh, thank you for, um, for clarifying. Um, so, just to then take a, a step back in, in, in terms of um, what the findings were in relation uh, to Rwanda, is that um, the, the, the Hutus and the, and the Tutsis, they were um, given this uh, false uh, um, prescribed status by uh, the colonial government, uh, and it was done so in a way uh, to d divide and conquer, in, in essence, uh, to, in order to uh, ensure the control uh, of those uh, of those people in, in what is now Rwanda, and so they they were not technically uh, separate ethnic groups because they had, as I said, you know, this, this common language and a culture, and it was this um, false um, classification that was put on them, and then that false classification was then used uh, as a, a reason. Um, uh, to to commit genocide, and the uh, when the ICTR held that the Tutsis were a separate ethnic group for the purposes of genocide, what they were doing is that they were saying that in committing these particular acts, the um, the perpetrators were viewing the victims as a, a, a particular um, separate group and treating them as a, a permanent and stable group in a way uh, that became, is a, is a protected group. Uh, and that's what the ICTR uh, held. And the parallel um, that we were suggesting can be um, drawn with the um, Songun classification is that this is also uh, a, an artificial classification in a way that it has been created by, by the state, by the state government. And it is one that is then uh, imposed upon uh, the citizens of the DPRK. And it is, uh, as I'm sure uh, many of the, the delegates know a lot more than I do uh, about Songmen, but the fact is that it, it is this prescribed uh, artificial uh, classification that is used to treat the, um, the people within the group, within the hostile group, uh, in a clearly very separate a negative way in compared to uh, the other um, uh, other citizens that don't fit into the hostile group. So what we're saying is that um, potentially, if you have 
clear parallel here of uh, this artificial classification that was imposed on people who really um, are, all, are from the same group. They share the same language, culture, ethnicity, but it's used as a way to demarcate them and treat them differently to the rest of the wider uh, population. Uh, it is used to differentiate them and then also therefore used to uh, potentially then commit either crimes against humanity, but in this case obviously uh, genocidal acts. The, uh, the argument should be like that. Yeah, thank you very much, Nathan. I hope it helps. And uh, uh, now I hope that at least few of you from the audience here on location would have questions. Yes. Would you please, um, microphone is behind you. And could you please uh, state your name and the organization you represent? Okay. Thank you so much for organizing this event. I'm Jimmy, working for Citizens Alliance for Ministry and Human Rights. And I have a question to Mr. Eric Hosket. Um, so I was really, personally, I was really glad to find that the current uh, OHCHR report on the accountability covers the uh, works about the paradise on Earth operation, which displaced around over 90,000 ethnic Koreans from, from Japan to North Korea. So I was wondering that whether there's any update, like since then, um, to the current. So I, I wanted to know about that. And I have one other question about the legal interpretation. So about the issue. So the CYE report in 2014 uh, identified that, uh, recognized that the majority of uh, the misdemeanors consist the majority of the enforced disappearance committed by the North Korean government. But the operation itself, the, this, the Paradise on Earth operation itself does not have the official legal frame yet. So I, w I was wondering whether like there was any like relevant discussion about the uh, concern, or do you have any other plans to like discuss that in the future? Thank you. Uh, it's almost as if I had asked you to ask that question <laughs> to give me the opportunity to say uh, that our office is currently working on a, uh, a report on enforced disappearance. Uh, from our perspective, the report will most likely cover uh, abductions from the ROK and from other countries, um, other forms of enforced disappearance within the DPRK, uh, and Paradise on Earth campaigns. So we have been reaching out to uh, victims and survivors organizations uh, in Japan. Uh, of course, this uh, this issue remains extremely important to the Japanese community and the Japanese government. Um, so we will, we will be including it in our paper. We do have to acknowledge that the fact pattern of Paradise on Earth is a little bit different from the very sort of specific, you know, if we look at the Rome Statute, it is a little bit different from the very specific legal definition of forced disappearance and we will have to deal with that in our research, but we are including it in a broader project to examine those issues. Especially because as we keep mentioning, most of these crimes, most of the enforced disappearances and uh, Paradise on Earth were a very long time ago. And so we also are aware of the sense of urgency that time really is running out for uh, victims and their families who are, who are much older and the evidence is harder to find. Uh, so thank you for asking that. We will have a report that I hope will be very useful to you, hopefully by the end of the year. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Microphone. Uh, 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 Telegram, 
가해자들 또 특정 가해자들 중이야. 이 문제에 대해서 이제는 ICC 보고서를 비롯해서 여러 가지 문제로 또그 피해자들이 증언을 통해서 많이 나오고 있습니다. 그런데 실질적인 대책을 어떻게 해야 되는가? 여기 이제 변호사님들께서 그 합법적인 문제, 그 증거 사실 이, 이 문제가 가장 중요한 문제입니다. 이것을 하자게 되면 그 특정 국가에 들어갈 수 없는 상황을 상황을 비례할 때에 그 어떤 방법이 더 필요한가 아니면 어떤 협력이 더 필요한가에 대해서 좀 구체적으로 NGO 단체들과 우리 그 피해자들에게 알려주었으면 감사하다고 말씀드립니다. 제가 아저 이대란 변호사님, 이대란 변호사님. 그 트러스 박사님 혹시 예, 제가 정리를 해서 답변을 바로 해도 되겠습니까? 아, 저 김동현 선생님 감사합니다. 저 일단은 아까 네덜란드 대사님은 가셨고요. 아, 지금 실은 오늘 이 자리는 아직 뭐 지금까지 여러 방안들의 얘기가 나오긴 했습니다만 오늘 이 자리는 어, 북한의 발인노적 범죄 책임 규명을 위한 방법들을 실은 이런 이런 것들이 있고 그리고 우리가 이러한 장단점이 있으니 한번 고민을 해보자 라고 하는 자리입니다. 실은 어, 오늘 뭐 마이클 커비 대법관 그리고 제프리 다스경 그리고 여러 토론자 발제자들이 말씀을 해주셨지만 아직 딱 부러지게 정확하게 어떤 방법이 좋다 그리고 어떻게 하는 것이 좋다라는 결론까지는 나오지는 못했어요. 그래서 실은 우리가 여기 많은 전문가들 그리고 한국과 해외에 있는 여러 전문가들과 함께 이 방법을 어, 찾아보려고 어, 만든 계기가 될 것입니다. 그래서 그렇게 좀 알아주셨으면 감사하겠습니다. 감사합니다. If I may, I, I'd also like to contribute to the answer. Uh, from our perspective, we are mandated by the Human Rights Council to, uh, to maintain an evidence repository. And that includes information that our office has been gathering. It also includes any information about human rights violations that other organizations want to contribute. So for example, they can be interview reports, original research, um, petitions that have been submitted to the UN working groups. And we have to keep in mind, we don't know what the future holds in terms of accountability. There may be a case before the ICC or maybe not. There may be a situation where some sympathetic country does go forward with domestic trials under universal jurisdiction, or may not. The information that we are gathering and that is shared with us by organizations for the repository may not necessarily meet the, the standards to be entered as evidence in those trials. However, they do provide leads to generating more information. So the, the situation that we envisage is that perhaps in the future, if there's an ICC case, the prosecutor of the ICC could come to our database, search very specifically for specific crimes in specific locations that fit a specific profile, and then would want to reach out to the individuals or the organizations that provided that information. So, the role of NGOs and civil society in gathering that information is the most important thing we have. Because for example, comparing the work of Korean organizations, including with other victims and escapees, the access that, that those organizations have to the escapee community is vastly, vastly better than anything uh, bureaucrats like myself could do. 
So those organizations are able to gather so much more and more high quality information that really could be very useful uh, long term. And could also, in, if that happens in the future, those same organizations might facilitate introductions and interactions between victims and witnesses and prosecutors and investigators. Thank you very much, Mr. Custard. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for these last interventions. Here with uh, I am concluding this uh, uh, conference, uh, and I would like to thank all of you here with us for your um, uh, attention and patience because we ran out of time somewhat. I would like to thank our audience elsewhere in the world, especially in Europe, and we do understand and appreciate the burden put on you for your early uh, business contribution with our breakfast. Uh, we appreciate it that very much. Uh, Sir Jeffrey and uh, Ruby, Nathan, Adam, and Holly, thank you for your excellent work and for NK Watch the chance to present it. And for the last 30 seconds, I would like to wrap up what we have been doing for two and a half hours. Uh, first stepping stones have been made. We have opened the discussion about the uh, avenues to seek accountability. This process cannot be imposed on you by us foreigners, by people from outside your space. Not only local NGOs are very important to uh, come to an action, but their constant cooperation and communication, exchange information with all sorts of victims, individuals and victims' organizations is essential. Only victims, those on receiving end of the suffering harms and crimes should have ownership of this process because justice should be for them and only then for us all, for humanity in a global world. Because your suffering matters to all of us and especially seeking for solution will be important for development of this very important but troubled field of international criminal law. So first thing is take ownership. It should be your initiative ask us to help as much, and we will as much as we can, but exchange of information, not cooperating in a, in a more, you don't need to fight in cooperation, but being, uh, having a single objective will actually naturally unite all your efforts, your knowledge, your database and so forth. And third message is, yes, this intergenerational cross-generational effort is very important. We see very young, new faces. Your effort will continue after we all are retired and gone. This is not a problem that can be solved just because we made decision and have chosen the coach. This is going to be ongoing struggle that will be of personal importance for all of you who suffered, for all your lost ones because of this suffering, but there will be no instant and quick fix for this very, very complex problem. Doesn't mean we should give up. On contrary, if you do not participate in a race, you will never be able to win. So at least we can say that there is some sort of um, imaginary uh, start shot fired and that we could all join our forces and see what is possible to tackle this important issue for you, but also for the rest of the humanity. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you very much. And also, we want to send our deepest thanks to no fans who are participating, participating in Japan. Thank you. We are now done with the official program of the conference. We send our deepest thanks to all the online and offline participants. And can you prepare a small gift for today's participants? Please receive the gift on your way home. Thank you. <laughs>